Hi everyone. Just one second. Okay, so here's the link for the uh, slides today. What? Hmm. So for some reason, my screen sharing from the iPad is not working. So it's really weird. Okay, I guess um, today we're gonna do it without the pen. Things should be fine. We don't have that many things to write today. So, All right, so um, hopefully you see the slides. Just one second. All right, yeah, please um, yeah, note that my voice is not really functioning well today, so um, I might need to drink water a lot. All right. okay. So let's first uh, begin with the quiz. So last week was uh, mostly tutorial, so I don't think we have uh, many things to really quiz about, so, but I just wanted to um, have a some vote for the attendance. And I think it will be interesting to share these things. So I'll give you one minute to answer these quiz and questions. Yep, the hardest quiz so far. One minute. Oh, by the way, the Hellbound is the Korean uh, drama in the um, Netflix too. Just in case you didn't know. It was just released, I think last Friday.
Okay, so announcements first. So the assignment four is um, due on December 6th. So um, basically it's uh, two weeks from last Monday and I already uploaded on the, um, the, uh, the calendar or the schedule website, course website. So uh, it should be, I think, even easier than assignment three for many of you. So hopefully um, it's not much of a uh, work. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting that um, really using the more recent technology is easier than using older ones, apparently. I mean, using BERT is much easier than trying to create your own LSTMs. And it's doing actually much better too, right? So it's very uh, ironic in some sense, because I think in most other technologies, usually the older ones are usually easier, right? Not always, but... And today's lecture will be actually second last lecture. And next Monday, we'll have a last lecture that will be wrapping up a lot of things, including we're going to discuss a bit about the um, GPT-3 and the more recent trends. Although um, I think with respect to the class I taught last semester, we put more focus on the um, pre-birth and uh, pre-birth materials and actually less focus on the, um, the post-BERT. One reason is that actually I'm also thinking about creating a new class on large language models that will be taught in uh, one year from now, not next semester. So I think it was, I was trying, it was too much to actually put everything into one class, including the large language models. So um, yeah, it's uh, this class is more geared towards uh, um, things that were popular before the large language models and with us uh, some, materials on large language models, such as BERT, early ones, and the more recent ones, I'm trying to cover that in the new class, more advanced class that I'm planning to teach next semester. Not next, I'm in the, um, from two semesters from this semester. So next fall. And for those of you who are not actually, um, who actually chose to do final project instead of um, all, all the four assignments. So, um, so as a recap, you can either do four assignments or two assignments and the final project. If you chose to do the assignments and also do final project, then we'll be dropping the two lowest score assignments. So um, you will not be, I mean, you don't have to really um, make any, I would say, uh, you know, there's nothing really complicated there that it's quite apparent that two assignments will be dropped, lowest scores. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that not everyone will be doing final project. So, um, so if you are not presenting final project, even then um, I'm asking you to come to the class so that you can uh, see what other people are working on. So we'll, we'll take attendance on this final project presentation too. It's Monday and Wednesday, but it's quite easy attendance um, and attendance, right? So um, we'll take the um, same attendance on Monday and Wednesday. And, um, the final project report is due on 15th, which is the um, Wednesday, so, so that we can actually have time to grade these and then um, give you back the grades um, before the, I would say, the, like, I think in December, before January comes. Okay, there were a few. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, so I'll, I'll actually um, tell you my answers too, yeah. Um, when we're okay, so there was a question that um, how can we change our option from for final project? Um, so if you're moving from the final project to assignments, um, you don't really have to do anything because the whole point of the survey was more of a I didn't want you to work on something. Um, I mean, start working on something in the last minute that would not be actually uh, appropriate for the uh, as a final project, but then. You can, uh, anytime you can change from the doing the project to the assignments. So don't worry about that. If you're going the other way, then um, basically, that, which means you will have to actually um, make sure your project topic is appropriate. So um, I highly discourage you to do that. If there is uh, anyone who is doing that, then please let me know, but, or actually please um, let the TA know the TA responsible for final project is Mia, so please let her know. But yeah, as uh, as uh, Hansa 
said uh, going from project to assignments is fine without any um, confirmation from me or the TAs. So you can just do that if you want to. Any other question? And we have, um, sorry about the uh, delay in the uh, delay in the getting you back, getting, getting you back the assignment to, uh, we'll do that uh, quite soon. Here, I mean, the grades of the assignment too. So I think there isn't much to recap in a, a lecture 16 because it was more of a um, um, tutorial. So we talk about the Hugging Faces Transformers library, which is very convenient way to use BERT and also other language models too. So in general, if you learn to use these, actually you will do that in assignment four for both token classification and question answering. Um, then it, it's very, um, in, in that case, then um, it will be very useful for you to do any, uh, for you when you're doing anything related to NLP in the future. So actually, um, especially if you're interested in, well, um, using the NLP techniques in modern applications and assignment four is probably very important. So we talk about the hugging face library and uh, we saw that the library is very popular right now with uh, um, it basically began from a, a chatbot making company, but uh, now it's more of a ML ops and um, basically more of a machine learning company in general. And uh, there was a tutorial link and there's, um, um, there was a final project tutorial by Mia. So um, hopefully that went well. And um, just reminder, you don't have to work on the uh, open domain QA. If you, that's, just a, that's just a topic that you can work on if you choose to. And actually now I really find that I think very few people will be working on the open domain QA because they have the option not to work on final projects. So, um, but anyways, um, so yeah, actually, oh, wait, where the, um, hmm, I'm not sure where the quiz went to. Okay, it's fine. I think quiz went to here. Yeah, it's my bad. It should be actually up there, but yeah. So um, I'll, um, I'm finishing the, I'm closing the poll a bit earlier than other days because I will have to actually end my lecture today a bit earlier too, um, but I'm ending now. I'm gonna say first. Okay, so let's share the results. All right, so it looks like about 70% of the students watch the um, Squid Game and um, about 75% didn't watch uh, the Hellbound and um, about 75% are actually going abroad in the winter vacation. So actually the number is exactly the same. Like, are they the same people? Like people who didn't watch the um, Hellbound are not going out. I don't know, but um, yeah, I think um, you ask what my answers are. So I can say that I my answer is actually yes to everything. Yep, I watched all of them. Um, actually like for Squid Game and for both Squid Game and Hellbound I actually watched in um, like, uh, I watched it right after it was released and um, basically, I just stayed up all night to watch it. So, yeah, I think I think both were released on Friday, right? So it was it was good for me because I didn't have any meeting on Friday back then. Okay, so and yep, I think that's um, about it for the um, poll. So hopefully, um, yeah, can probably stop sharing now. All right, so let's come back to the, um, the lecture of today. So today's lecture will be a bit short. Um, 
but what we want to talk about today is actually um, pre-training for generation. So of course there, um, so I think we, I think I forgot to put the recap here because um, we had a discussions before the tutorial, which are, I think, um, relevant to today's lecture, which is the fact that we are talking about BERT, first of all, and also we talked about ExcelNet, um, Roberta, and I think, did we talk about anything else? But anyways, so we talk about these things, which are basically replacing BERT. We, and BERT is primarily for um, classification. So they cannot generate sentence because they're only using the encoder side of transformer. And that there is a lot of uh, advantage to that. One is that when you are masking out, you can actually uh, mask out multiple tokens and then try to guess them at the same time. So there are some advantage to the just using the encoder side. But then the and also decoder requires a lot of computations because you when 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 you're actually well, I mean. Um, decoder actually is not too bad during training, but during inference, it will be more in general, um, more time, uh, higher time complexity because you have to actually apply the uh, decoder side transformer um, for every decoding time step. Not just, you cannot just generate with the one, one, um, one application of the decoder, right? That's the um, really the time complexity of a decoder. But well, but then, after the BERT has emerged in late 2018, and then it was clear that pre-training is certainly something that works. It was rather, well, natural that people were now interested in whether the same principle applies to not just classification, but also the generation. So one of the first things that people have tried is actually GPT-2. So we talk about GPT-1, right? It was a before GPT-1. So if you remember the timeline, GPT-1 was released in um, around June of uh, 2018. So like about three to four months before BERT was released. And back then, GPT-1 was mostly focusing on the transfer learning and also whether they can do that with, uh, they can do the target task with the uh, fine tuning only. So GPT-1 was, I think, meaningful because it showed that you don't need additional architecture to do the target task. You only need to change or tune the parameters. And that was exactly, I think, the, the beginning of a data-centric paradigm where of course, the model is not, I'm not saying the model is not important, but then in many cases, in most application oriented cases, definitely um, model is not probably the most important thing, but what really matters is the data itself. Because even if you're not changing the model or you're not actually um, specializing the model for the target task, even then it's, it's very actually easy to achieve high accuracy with the same architecture and just fine tuning. So that was GPT-1 and uh, in, uh, in the, um, well, the June of 2018. And then October 2018, BERT came up. And of course it was submitted to NACL. That, that's why actually um, BERT is technically, I mean, officially it was released in 2019, but then, um, and then after BERT, now people um, will interest in whether they can actually extend this to generation. So, but then GPT-2 is a bit different um, from other models that I'll talk about in that they didn't really focus on the, really the fine tuning part, which is like, a, I mean, which was the case, I mean, BERT was focusing on the fine tuning, right? I mean, BERT itself is not doing anything um, or like almost nothing. Um, what BERT is only useful when you fine tune BERT to the target task, but then, GPT-2 is a bit different because what they were interested in here was that, can they create a large language model um, that's trained on large corpus and then basically make it to generate text given the, um, the 
a few sentences or a few words to begin with. And I'm not sure you remember this, but in mid 2019, um, like June 2019, I think, um, there are a lot of uh, uh, buzz that um, AI can write news articles. And then the uh, it's really hard to distinguish between the AI generated news article and also the actual uh, human humans reporter generated reporter written news article. And of course, if you look into the details, there are actually issues that GPT two cannot do well. But then, um, if you just like read it without thinking much about the contents, then it's very fluent. So GPT twos um, the 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 main achievement I think is the fact that it was very fluent. Um, it could actually, it showed that the text generation can be very, very fluent. And that was actually not the case until then. So um, it's really worth noting that um, text generation was considered to be a really hard problem. It is true that the um, generating text condition on some something is not, well, super new because um, that's exactly machine translation is one type. And we know that machine translation has worked pretty well since like 2015 or 2016. So it makes sense because in that case, um, text generation is conditioned, which means there is a very relatively one-to-one -one relationship between the input and the output, right? But if you are talking about um, a task that's, well, I mean, I cannot say actually, this is also conditioned on something, but then I think the really importance is that whether it's a well-defined one-to-one relationship such as machine translation, or it's not one-to-one, -one, it's like one-to-many, or it can be any, uh, there are a lot of outputs that are possibly correct and have different meanings, such as can you generate the, can you auto-complete the, the rest of the news articles given the first one or two sentences. And clearly, let's say you're given like one sentence or two sentences in the news article, and then you're asked to generate the other, uh, the rest of the article, there are very many possibilities, right? Um, not like machine translation where, um, where we're trying to actually keep the semantics. Semantics is equivalent to meaning, right? So machine translation by definition has to keep the meaning, whereas, in text generation, you're not your job is not to keep the meaning and then uh, map to another space, but it's more of a you want to actually really generate something that's new, that's something that's not the content-wise not actually given. So I just wanted to point out the difference. And people thought that's really hard. Like I mean, how can you do that? But then GPT two actually proved that actually that's uh, quite possible. So again, we cannot really say GPT-2 was used a lot for pre-training. Um, it's most more, I think was focus was more on the generation itself, but then still there were, uh, it's also being used for pre-training. It was also used for pre-training. So, and it's still being used. Uh, it's actually one of still uh, most popular decoder only models that people use. So um, I think it's worth noting. And as we will see next week, and um, well, I think you'll also, have learned of, uh, heard about is that GPT-3 is different from GPT-2 in that it focuses on the fuchsia learning. So, and of course uh, we know that the GPT-3 also can do um, very fluent text generation. So uh, three is more about, can you do fuchsia learning on top of the GPT-2? So that was the main point, uh, main argument in GPT-3 paper. So now actually, okay, so we're gonna actually, so for the, we're gonna actually briefly take a look at the paper together. So I think it's a um, good opportunity for you to really um, see the details. Mm. I think it's uh, okay. 
All right, so this is GPT-2. So um, really the interesting part in this paper is the fact that, wait. It's actually this part. So, um, so look at this um, table. So it's what they say is that examples of naturally occurring demonstration of English to French and French to English translation found through the web text training set. So what they're actually um, arguing is that because we are able to observe these training examples in the um, in the corpus. So suppose that the language model is trained to, um, given this text generate the rest of the sentence, then clearly the model has to know the machine translation ability, right? So what they're arguing in here is that, okay, if you use a large enough corpus that contains different kinds of information, then it is possible that we can expect that model will be able to do something like machine translation. And if you actually think of this, it's like similar to Suppose your news article or some of your article start with um, um, prompts like, I'm not, uh, well, um, if something like uh, tr translate the following sentence to French, then if, we, if the model is able to complete that article pretty well, then we, we know that the model has to be able to translate. So that was one example. And the, the paper was saying that the, because the corpus is very diverse, if the language model is able to really autocomplete the, um, the, the remaining sentences, then it, we can safely say that the model is able to actually uh, do different kinds of tasks. So that's why the, the paper's title is language models are unsuper unsupervised multi-test learners, including machine translation. So they were testing different things. Um, one is translation and then they saw that as the number of parameters in LMs increase, their, their blue score increases. And they wanted to compare this to actually the unsupervised statistical MT, which is a very complicated um, model that's basically um, doing machine translation without the training data. So they're not comparing, of course, with the uh, models that were trained on the MT data set which is much higher than this. But what they're saying is, if you're comparing with the some unsupervised models, then this language model is doing a bit better than that. Um, some of them, I mean, like this model is really bad model. Like the noisy model is really bad. And nearest neighbor, well, it's not probably the, a good model, but that's still what they're saying is it's actually able to do something that's more than I would say, um, it, at least it's somewhat useful. But it's actually more uh, promising in other data sets, like for instance, um, reading comprehension or um, summarization, because here you will see that they are actually not summarization maybe, but the reading comprehension, we see that it's quite comparable to uh, models that were actually supervised, although actually supervised with the, uh, all the models are actually um, pre birth which means they, were, they are deep learning based. Uh, Dr. QA is deep learning based, but then LSTMs, but then they are not, um, what do you call, um, it's not BERT based. So um, it's not, of course, doing better than the state of the art, but then what they're saying is, oh, they're actually, it, they can do pretty well if you actually formulate the problem in the same way. So something like you ask, ask the question and then ask the model to complete the rest of the, um, the sentence or the document by answering the question. So that was um, an interesting thing. And then uh, really the, actually the, I think where really the paper shined was their examples, what, what they actually showed, um, because they were, it was very clear that the, the auto completion they made with the articles were really good. So, Here's an interesting example. So you give the, this context, um, and then if you actually take a look at the um, GPT-2 completion, it's very natural. Like you can even uh, distinguish that from human written articles in many cases. Um, so 
yeah, I um, encourage you to look at these things and they basically show that it's a very natural thing. So although their paper, paper's title was more focused on the multitask learning uh, with, um, without any training data, I think uh, really one of a really the, the big takeaways from this paper was the fact that the generation can be very fluent. Okay, so let's come back to um, All right, so that was GPT-3, I mean, two, I mean, in, the, um, in June of uh, 2019. And then later came on that year in 2019, um, up, well, it, it says 2020 because it was actually published in, uh, I think, was it NACL? I think, I don't remember quite well, but then um, the paper was archived in, I think, uh, something like September. So BART was uh, more geared towards pre-training. Than other things. So um, the difference between BART and BERT was that they used the entire transformer instead of just the encoder side. So input is similar to BERT, but then the output is different, right? And then, oh, I mean, actually input is actually not exactly sim same, but then uh, quite similar in the sense that um, the input gets, um, we the, um, they, they injected noise into the inputs. So BART is still denoising autoencoder. Um, I think I told you that what denoising means is the fact that the model, the, the, the input data is corrupted with some noise and the model is asked to recover the original sentence that before the, applying the noise. So that's, that's called denoising. So that's why people call that BART is denoising autoencoder. And BART is also denoising autoencoder, but I think it's more accurate to say that BART is more, um, it's more complete autoencoder than BERT because BERT, um, the autoencoding part is more of a guessing the mask words directly. But then what BART does is that the, um, they basically try to generate the, the correct output. So the, the tokens still get masked in, in BART, but then it's different from BERT in that the um, correct output is, entire correct output is generated. So the BART said that there are two purposes for this. Number one is that they can just use the encoder side of BART because BART was of course trained with the end-to-end -end, uh, encoder decoder network. So um, there are two, modules, encoder module and the decoder module. And BART says that you can just use the encoder side if you want to, and then it can replace BERT in some cases. And they show that the accuracy actually is better than BERT in some cases. But I don't think people use BART for that a lot because, um, well, the difference is not that high. And also there are other models like Roberta, which is doing pretty good and also, um, BART is actually more suitable for suitable for encoder decoder scenario where the where the um, what you want to do as the target task is not just text classification or the token classification, but more of a, a sequence to sequence task like for instance machine translation, right? Although I think it's worth noting that machine translation has a lot of data, a lot of training data that um, it's not really, I would say, benefiting a lot from these pre-trained language models. But um, let's, let's say if you want to do summarization, then it's good an abstractive summarization where the output is generated instead of extracted, then good place to start with will, will be uh, starting from the pre-trained models like BART. So let's take a look at the BART briefly. Um,
Okay, so apparently BART was actually released in October. So you see that um, it's actually about four months after GPT-2 was released. And um, what they do is, they're saying here that BERT is basically, you have a input A, B, C, D, E, and then you mask B and D, and then try to guess this thing in this encoder, which is bidirectional because it's a transformer encoder. Transformer decoder is not bidirectional, it's autoregressive. And what and then they are also comparing with the GPT and GPT-2. They're actually quite similar architecture in that uh, what they do is it's just decoder with the um, single direction. So it's autoregressive because they were trying to create language model. And they're arguing that it's actually BART is different from the BERT because instead of just trying to guess these mask words up here, they actually try to reconstruct everything on the decoder side. And also it is more beneficial compared to GPT because GPT only can do the um, already aggressive decoding, which means when they're trying to guess, for instance, a B, GPT one or two is only able to look at A. Whereas in BART, because the A, B, E all goes into the encoder input, they can all uh, refer to the context, every context that nearby to guess um, B. So that's the exactly the difference between BART and BERT or GPT. So that's what they're doing. But then other than that, it's quite similar to BERT or GPT in that they basically train this on, or I mean, it's quite similar to BERT in that they train on a similar corpus and then try to use that for the target task. And they do a, a few interesting target tasks, not just um, classification, but also sick, sick to sick because they can, they just because they can do that, unlike BERT, we can, which cannot do generation task. So for instance, they try a few different tasks um, sequence classification, token classification, and these two are also doable with BERT, right? But then sequence generation and the machine translation are not possible with BERT. So that's the important thing. They also discuss different, um, different objectives for pre-training, but I think we can um, skip that. Please take a look at the paper if you're interested in different kinds of um, losses, but it's worth noting it, looking at the, the results. So. As you see, these, this is token classification. This is more of a sequence classification. So that's why we have the BERT numbers. And we see that actually MLI, BERT is doing the best compared to BART, but then in squad, they actually are able to improve the score by um, 2.3. Although I think there is, it is also possible that this is because um, the BERT was under-trained. But the, really the advantage I think comes at where the bird cannot be applied at all, like a summarization for, yeah, I think all of these are actually summarizations. So they actually do pretty well. And if you actually look at the, some of the other models actually, but by the way, this perplexity is to lower the better. And then as you see, although in the um, LE5, the um, some language model trained on similar size corpus is doing better, but then other tests like summarization X sum or convey I2, the BART is doing better with text infilling with um, some drop in perplexity. And in the CN daily mail summarization task, they're doing much better than the baselines. Okay. So I think they also probably test this on the machine translation. So they actually also show that the, they're doing better in the baselines. Um, so it's quite encouraging that actually this kind of model can be quite easy to uh, approach state of the art or better than state of the art without much issues. So that's BART. And now let's actually, so if you were, um, okay, so that's it. So we're not gonna have a break today because I'll have to cover, I mean, I'll, I'll have to actually end the class sooner than, I'll have to end this class at exactly 5 p.m. So, so we're gonna just use the rest of 20 minutes to cover the, all the materials and then 
I'll let you go early today. Okay, so let's come back to And then there was a work from Google. So Bart was, by the way, coming from Facebook, which is now Meta. And then also in the same, um, around the same time, there was a work from Google, which is called P5. And what they did was they converted every NLP problem into a text-to-text -text format. So it is actually similar to BART in that they actually also do sequence to sequence for pre-training, but then they don't just end there, which means they don't just end the um, pre-training steps, but then they also convert every, every NLP task into text to text format. And then they used um, some very large scale corpus compared to BART. And with this, they were able to actually achieve the state of, art, state of the art in many popular tasks. So um, let's take a look at this paper. It's quite long paper, actually. It's like 67 pages. Okay, so as you see, this was actually released in around the same time. It's a, it was released in the um, October of 2019. So it's very concurrent work to BART. And the, I think last update it was uh, last year. So what they're doing is they're not just actually trying to, um, well, do the, um, denoised autoencoder thing. So you can think of this language model, I mean, this denoised autoencoding problem as a also sequence to sequence task, right? Or text to text. So what they're saying is that, okay, we want to make every problem in the world into text to text format. And language corpus is just one kind of it. It's not just about pre-training, but you can think of that as also text to text framework because you're trying to, it, in that case, your task is that your input is um, some text with noise and you're trying to guess what the uh, original text is. And you can do the similar thing with different kinds of tasks, like for instance, translation. Then in that case, then um, you want to translate the sentence into this. So you can uh, actually describe your task, translate English to German, and that is good. And basically that gets translated into dai u. I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, and then, and then um, you can also do some sentence classification. Although I think it's a bit lame to really um, say the name of the task here, like cola sentence. But I think you get the point that you can actually translate every task into this some um, um, text to text format. So that's why actually it's called T5 because text it's a text to text. What was it? Transformer transfer learning, something like that. So it's like transfer is T, text T, T, 2T, text T, and transform T. So there are five Ts. That's why it's called T5. It's very um, lame name too, right? There you go. Yeah, text to text transfer transformer. But I mean, maybe name is quite funny, but then the, the, what they show was really actually um, quite astonishing back then because they were able to actually achieve this state of art in many tasks. Um, so for instance, where was it? Um, so they did a lot of experiments. So it's really long paper. So maybe unless you're really interested, it's quite hard to read the entire paper, but I think the, the really the, the core um, experimental results are at the at the back of the paper. So, for instance, um, but they did really a lot of uh, different kinds of experiments, like what kind of data set they should use, uh, what kind of a uh, loss they should use, 
um, a lot of a tuning things and like um, how many tokens they should use like full data set and then they tried with the smaller ones and it was pretty clear that uh, using full data set is the best but um, all these things basically um, are more of a unit test but then they tried to put everything together at the end they basically they were detailing how they got to this point they're actually quite um, honest about how they were able to create this model um, what kind of things they tried and failed but at the end what they were saying is that t5 11 billion parameter model is able to actually beat most of the previous best ones in many different data sets so uh, this is uh, here are like all classification tasks, but they're also non-classification tasks like machine translation. Although um, we can say that it didn't beat the previous best because, um, well, I think machine translation is very advanced area with a lot of data. So it's maybe not benefiting, benefiting a lot, but then other than that, you will see that the, all the ball prints are in the T5 11 billion. So it was pretty clear that this is doing pretty well on most data sets that where the number of data, number of um, well examples available for training is not as many as um, machine translation. So yeah, that's a long paper, but anyways, hopefully um, it's clear what the paper was about. And coming back to okay, so. After this, actually, one of the interesting approaches approaches that the, the same people did was so-called closed book QA. So if you look at these tasks that T5 did, some of them, actually, most of them are quite clear how they can work. For instance, um, you, you are actually making this into a very clear input output problem, a classification classify the following sentence into true or false, and then output is either true or false, which is quite straightforward, right? But then it becomes a bit tricky if you do, uh, you ask questions like, instead of, I mean, you actually want the model to do tasks like question answering, where you ask things like, when was Albert Einstein born? And then the answer is something like 1885 or something like that. And well, why is not, why is it, why is it different from the other task? Because in other tasks, if the model is able to do, do well on one example, we can expect that model will be able to generalize that ability to do that task to other examples that are unseen. But then if you're actually doing more of a question answering, which is fact-based, you cannot really expect the model to know, for instance, when the Tesla was born, even if it was trained when the Einstein was born, because Facts are not generalizable. But very astonishingly, T5 was able to do that. And this was because T5 learned this factual knowledge when it was being pre-trained on the large language corpus, which contains this kind of knowledge. And actually, it's not really only T5, but also this was also shown in GPT-2 paper. They tried open domain question answering, and although it's not that great, but then it was quite amazing that some of the questions GPT-2 was able to answer. So I think we cannot just give credits, credits to T5. Probably we should give credits to both T5 and GPT-2. But you can basically start from the T5 pre-trained model and then fine tune it on question answer pairs without the documents that questions should refer to, to get the answers. So it's very, um, in some sense, very not, um, intuitive way, but then it's basically assuming that the knowledge is contained inside the language model. And then they actually were able to find that this paper reports at all 2020, some of the close book, some of the question answering can be done and actually as good as some of the best models. So that's why they call it um, closed book QA because they are saying that the regular QA is more of an open book in a sense that the model is able to look up the documents or the book. But then in closed book QA, the model cannot 
see the documents or the book at all. So um, it's more hard, it's harder task. But it's also noting, it's worth noting that criticisms exist. So this paper um, in 2020 found that the, the model does well only when the questions were seen during training. So basically when the training and test time examples overlap, then the model does well, but then when the model was given non seen examples or the uh, first seen examples, then model was not doing that much well. But even then, it's not actually getting 0%. It's more of a, the accuracy is not as high as the paper originally advertised. So I think it's more of a, it's, but model is not as good as they thought. But still, we it's clear that language models are able to contain the factual knowledge inside them so that they can be extracted in some cases, but I think there are still research going on how we can extract that kind of knowledge better. So it's worth note, worth taking a look at these two papers if you're interested in this direction, but we're gonna actually um, skip for now. And before going to next lecture, next Monday, after these things came out, so as you see, T5 and BART came out in late 2019. And after that, or before that, there were a few other works. There are actually many works that were doing pre-training, actually viewing the pre-training in different aspects. For instance, um, one work is Arbert, which is in 2020, early 2020. And what they did, what they were focusing more on, one, they, they were focusing on how they can lower the memory consumption and also increase training speed of BERT. And what they did is that they basically, um, they reduced the parameters by having factorized embeddings. So they're making the um, embedding into um, multiplication of two smaller parameters. And they also shared parameters across layers. So it's memory efficient, also uh, training speed efficient. And they show that this can be actually leading to better results on glue, race, and squad, even with the fewer parameters than BERT large. Another work is Lectra. I think um, maybe many of you have heard of this too. So it's quite interesting in that Lectra is interested in making the pre-training objectives similar to GAN, the Generative Adversarial Network. So they have two modules. One is a generator which corrupts some tokens with possible alternatives. And the second module is discriminator, which guesses which tokens are fake because some of the tokens are generated by the, uh, the, the generator, right? So their experiments show that the, it's more effective than mass language model because the task is defined over all input tokens Whereas in BERT, you know that the only few tokens are masked and that's because you cannot mask everything, right? I mean, if you mask everything in BERT, then it, it's impossible to guess them. So by design, BERT has to mask only a few tokens. Whereas, so there, that's why they're claiming there is an inefficiency because you're, you can only train on these mask tokens. But then in Electra, because you are actually Try, you have to guess on every token whether each token is fake or not. So they're claiming that it's more efficient. And, and they actually show that the gains are particularly strong for small models. So I think bigger Electra models are not probably as good as or not better than BERT or Roberta, but then small Electra models are quite good because I think during pre-training, they're quite sample efficient. Another line of work is more on, oh, there are a few questions, right? Okay, so there was a question on the, could you elaborate on this criticism? Even human who doesn't know when Einstein was born could answer this question. Okay, so I'm not sure I oh, couldn't, okay. Okay, so, I, well, I mean, the, the point was that 
um, the criticism was that, so the T5 or GPT-2 were claiming that they can do open domain question answering by referring to the information that the models saw during pre-training and then somehow utilizing them during the fine tuning process. And the, the paper was criticizing that that's not exactly true because the model does well only when the questions overlap between training and test time during fine tuning basically. Whereas the um, existing open domain question answering models do pretty well on the whether the questions overlap or not. Of course, and also there is a, also criticism towards the data sets too, because data sets shouldn't have a overlap between train and test, but apparently due to the hardship in the control of the quality, there were a lot of uh, overlaps, it turns out. So that was the point. Did I answer your question? And there was other line of work such as mobile BERT, which was really about, can we compress and accelerate BERT so that they can be used for edge devices, edge devices being like smartphones or um, some even smaller devices than computers that cannot utilize the, the server. So they basically did a lot of bottleneck structures and the knowledge transfer to make it like five times smaller and faster than bird base and still achieving similar results. So other question is, I was confused thinking that they expected it to answer questions, answers to which the model never seen before. Oh yeah, that's true. But then I think the point is that the, um, they were still pre-trained on large corpus that probably contains the information required to answer the question. So just like humans, who, who let's say the human read the entire Wikipedia. I mean, probably not. I mean, the humans cannot do that, but then let's say that humans did that. And then if you ask humans um, these questions, you can expect that the humans will be able to answer many of them. If the humans are able to memorize all the information they saw during reading the Wikipedia, right? So that was their claim, the, um, the, the fact that the language models can do that way. But then the criticism was that, oh no, the models are not that good as good as what you said. So hopefully that's clear. Okay, so and other line of work was uh, more geared towards tech documents that are not just 1D, but more of a 2D text because many documents we read, even like the slides you're seeing right now is now one dimensional. It has a lot of uh, uh, two dimensional components such as font size and also um, where the text is located, et cetera, right? Um, so I think, it, so the point here is that the, um, the, they wanted to make a language model that is suitable for information extraction or semi-structured documents. And also it basically was able to use this and fine tune on these um, documents, 2D documents to get really good results. And it, it's good to check out some um, work such as um, Layout LM and also another work from Naver in 2021, uh, it's called Bros. And also there were a lot of uh, multilingual models because uh, apparently there are a lot of needs for non-English applications, right? So MBERT is, M stands for multilingual. So actually MBERT is able to handle like a hundred languages, something like that. MBART is also able to handle many different languages. And if you put M, usually it means multilingual. And sometimes they put the, the, the language name like Corbert or Corbart. So um, you can actually look up these things on Hugging Face. Hugging Face actually provides the repository for all these language models for different languages. Okay, so I think that's it for today's lecture. So um, I'm gonna end a bit earlier today and next lecture will be on the GPT-3 and some of the recent trend in NLP and it will be last lecture. So ho I hope to see you all, all of you there. And what next Wednesday again will be discussion that accounts for 5% of your grade. So uh, please be there as well. We'll be, the, doing this, we'll be doing the same thing, but just we are changing the domain from pre-birth papers to post-birth papers that you have seen or possibly read since like, I think um, late October.
or early November. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone. See you next week.